Oh, wow. Okay, so this officer is reading text messages going back and forth between Sydney's phone, Tammy's phone, Heather Elvis's phone, one of her friends. It's gotten very interesting, um, especially because a number of notes I took from this. One, Tammy was texting with a young male right before Heather Elvis went missing, and the mother of the young male asked Tammy to stop doing that. There's also some pretty incriminating text messages going back and forth. Uh, Ashley Wilcott, what do you make of these developments in, in, uh, involving the text messages? You know, this is something else, Rachel. I think that all of this goes to motive, right? And the personalities and the motive that Tammy Moore had to kidnap, abduct, and we don't know what else, to the victim, Heather Elvis. So it's really interesting to me, but I still think it doesn't focus on the prosecution and what the prosecution has to do to prove that Tammy was one of the ones that kidnapped this victim. And you're looking at a live shot right now as uh, we continue to hear testimony about uh, some of these text messages going back and forth. But in one point, Ashley, in the text messages that this officer is reading, um, they, they, it sounds like Tammy impersonated Sydney because we know that she had taken Sydney's phone after she got mad that he was having an affair. And there were some pretty threatening messages going from Sydney's phone to Heather's phone where Heather kind of figured out, wait a second, I'm not talking to Sydney here. I'm talking to the mad, angry wife who's been doing some crazy things. Um, you know, but does this prove anything other than obviously you've got a very scorned woman here? And so it does show the, the reason why Tammy may have kidnapped her. And it also goes to the evidence the prosecution has said is that Tammy understood that she was pregnant and that the father was Tammy's husband, Sydney. And so all of those things, again, go to motive. But I don't know that it directly proves that she kidnapped Heather Elvis. Gosh, this is getting very, very interesting. We're going to take a quick break here on the Law and Crime Network, and we're going to take you back inside that courtroom in just minutes. Stay with us. All right, so we're uh, talking about some critical phone activity from the night that Heather Elvis disappeared, specifically the fact that Heather Elvis tried to call Sydney Moore's cell phone several times in the early morning hours of December 18th, around 341, uh, I'm going back to my notes here, so I apologize, uh, 338, 349, 340, and 342. He doesn't answer. Ashley Wilcott, what do you make of this testimony here? Is well, it really, you know, one the of the question questions is, that it is begs it really for me. Heather I... Elvis calling? Yeah. So one of the questions it begs for me, Rachel, is who actually had the phone? Did Heather still have the phone as the victim or had somebody else taken her phone? Theoretically, it might have been Tammy on the phone. And the fact he wasn't answering is suspicious to me because from all the other texts, certainly he's in this uh, texting, sexting, sexual relationship with her. So why wouldn't he answer the phone? It just it leaves a lot of questions for speculation, I think. And then we also know, Ashley, that at 3.17 a.m., the night that Heather Elvis disappeared, that she called Sydney's phone. Well, there's a series of events. Uh, first, we know that Sydney Moore went to, uh, in, in the 2 o'clock a.m. hour, I need to get my timeline straight here because there's a many different time, uh, different time stamps here. But he, he makes a phone call uh, from a pay phone, okay? Then, uh, well, before that, he had bought a pregnancy test. And then at 3.17 a.m. that same night, um, Heather calls Sydney's phone. And they have a four-minute conversation. Was it with Sydney? Was it with Tammy? I don't know. It was Sydney's phone. That's odd. What do you make of that, Ashley? Right. I, you know, I completely agree with you. It's odd. And here's the thing that I think is going to come out of this testimony unanswered questions and really good potential arguments for the defense 
and the prosecution because they're going to take these facts and argue what they want about who had the phone and, and, and why there was a four minute call and if it who was on the other end of the line and why there was a conversation with Heather and why Heather was calling the phone. All I think this does is again open up good potential closing arguments based on the facts for both the defense and the prosecution. And again, I think it goes to motive, Rachel, but that in and of itself is not enough to get a jury conviction. Ashley, we're going to spend the next couple hours mapping out this phone timeline and try to put it together ourselves because I think it's critical in the prosecution's case. So as soon as we have that, we'll be sure to post it online. In the meantime, we have to take a quick break here on the Long Crime Network. Stay with us. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Okay, so after pleading guilty to the four killings on Monday, we do want to note that this man, Robert Rembrandt, who you, you just saw his image there that in the video, in December of 1997, he was convicted of voluntary manslaughter and sentenced to six years in prison for the death of another man in a Cleveland parking lot. He then went on to kill these others. Ashley Wilcott, this is just such a sad story. And, I mean, he is not really your traditional serial killer that, from what I could tell, demonstrate, demonstrated any kind of pattern. Right. I don't think there's a pattern. So while he may not be termed technically a serial killer, he is a repeat murderer, repeat killer, because certainly he's glad that he did kill all of these individuals. It's very, very sad. I'm glad he entered a plea and saved, quite frankly, the state, the taxpayers, the money to prosecute him. Absolutely. You know, this was expected to be a four to six week trial. So that's a ex uh, very significant state expense if they did go forward with trial. Regardless, they're going to be housing him for decades now. Let's turn now to uh, some, some sound that was played uh, during the sentencing hearing this morning when one of the victim's mother testified. Take a listen. Folks, uh, you were just listening to some very emotional testimony from one of the victims in that Ohio serial killer, the, the mother of one of the victims, sorry I misspoke there, um, of that Ohio serial killer, that case we've been following here on the Law and Crime Network. I want to turn now to some breaking news and another story that we are following, and that is the case against Tammy Moore in South Carolina. I am told, unfortunately, we weren't able to stream it to you, but I'm told just moments ago that the defense filed a motion for a mistrial in this case, and that was based on some of the text message testimony that you just heard from. Right now, we are trying to gather more information regarding this motion, what it entailed. But Ashley Wilcott, who's been with me this last hour, uh, are you surprised to hear the defense made a mistrial specifically having to do with this text message testimony? That's what I wonder. You know, prior to going to trial, we have pretrial motions where the attorneys talk to the court about this is what we think is admissible evidence, inadmissible evidence. My thought is that that some of the evidence through the text messages, the defense is arguing this was not admissible evidence, consequently a mistrial. So hmm. until we know more details, but I suspect that's their argument. OK, I got some more information for you, Ashley, just from a local report. Uh, apparently, the defense's motion for a mistrial is based on testimony about those text message, text messages, um, and the state argues that it relates to the conspiracy charge, among other things. Judge appears to admonish state for going too far, but he denied the motion for a mistrial. So uh, that means this trial is continuing. We are just getting word that the motion for a mistrial was denied. Um, but, you know, in these cases like this, it's not unusual several times throughout the prosecution's case that you see the defense making a motion for a mistrial. And I'm assuming at the end of their case, too, the defense is going to do the same thing. 
Completely agree with you, Rachel. That's the norm. That's the defense representing their client, and they're going to make these motions. So it sounds like they're arguing this was not relevant testimony to any of the charges. The state said it was relevant to conspiracy. The court said, hey, you've gone too far, but I'm going to deny. Most motions for mistrial statistically are denied. Well, it certainly paints Tammy to be a pretty bad person. Here she is uh, texting this under, you know, young male, um, and the young male's mother had to intervene and say, stop texting my son. So clearly, you know, even her, even though her husband was having an affair with this young girl, it sounds like she was having at least one affair, maybe other affairs as well. Um, and I do want to give an update on that courtroom. We had been taking that text message testimony live, but we're in a break right now. The jurors were allowed to go to lunch. And uh, just as soon as we go back there live, we will bring it to you. You won't miss a minute here on the Law and Crime Network. Let's turn back now, and sorry to jump around a bit, but I want to turn back to that emotional sentencing hearing from earlier this morning. This involved this guy, Robert Rembert, who was an accused serial killer that it, who admitted to the killings of four people. One of uh, the parents of one of the victims Morgan Neitzel addressed the judge. Take a listen to what they had to say. And you're just hearing from those parents how emotional it is. And, you know, the, the father there raises a very good point. This man had been convicted uh, back in 1997 of another killing. This time he was convicted on manslaughter charges. And from my research, he was released after six years. I can see why that father, Ashley, would be quite angry. Right, absolutely. Because also think about 1997, more than 20 years ago, the laws were a little different. Sentencing guidelines were very different. And so at that time to serve six and get out probably wasn't unusual. But it is true, had he not gotten out after six years, he wouldn't have committed all of these other murders. I mean. All right, Ashley, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we are going to hear from that Ohio serial killer in his own words as he addresses the judge. Stay with us here on the Law and Crime Network. Nothing I can say, all I can say, I'm sorry, and that you pray for me, I'm sorry. Ashley Wilcott, you're a family member of this guy, uh, of one of the victims here. How do you respond to something like this? I didn't think he looked that sorry when he just said that. Right. You know, it's I, I love the judge in this case because she responded as well as she possibly could under these circumstances, which was really, really sorry for your loss. It's heartbreaking. It's horrible. And, and she was glad the defendant said something. How many defendants do we see, Rachel, in these these trials covered by law and crime, that the defendant never says a word. And at least it doesn't mean anything in terms of the grief the family's going through, but perhaps it helps with closure that he actually does apologize for it. And he asks people to pray for him. Well, we'll certainly be continuing to follow this case um, alongside, I know, the victims' families as well. Let's turn now to another trial. As I said, we're very busy here on the Long Crime Network. Lots of trials going on across the country. Another one in Ohio, in the Toledo area. This is the case against Carl Wimpy. He's charged with murder and assault for an altercation outside of a bar. And the guy he's accused of killing is the guy who apparently tried to intervene in the fight and stop it. Let's listen to some of the prosecution's opening statements from this morning. He engages him. Yes. All right, so this is, uh, sounds like a kind of drunken situation, a bar night that spilled into a very, very dangerous and tragic night. Ashley Wilcott, what do you make so far of the prosecution's openings? Well, I think that the prosecution is laying out all the different pieces because they want to take away from the defense's argument that basically, um, you know, the victim's the one who started this. And on our client, the defendant didn't do anything wrong. He was defending himself. And the prosecution's laying it out to say he didn't just hit back, right? He ended up literally beating this person to death. 
Okay, speaking of defense, let's listen to some of their openings. Take a listen. Self-defense, that is Carl Wimpy's defense in this trial where he's facing um, that murder charge for a bar fight that ended in a guy's death. Ashley Wilcott, what do you make of the defense's opening statements, and do you think they'll sway the jurors? Well, here's what I like that defense did effectively. They tried to paint the whole picture and said, listen, you may see him hit or hear testimony he hit, but you also need to take into account all of the other things that you may not know. What was said, the gestures. Think about what the victim who now is deceased had in his blood. He had marijuana, he had other drugs, he had alcohol, legally intoxicated. So the defense is doing a really good job, I think, Rachel, of painting that entire picture for the jury to consider. To, to lend credit or cred credence or credit to the self-defense theory. And of course, Ashley, as the defense attorney indicated there, there is surveillance footage that I'm sure the jurors are gonna see. Okay, we're gonna take a quick break. We're gonna, when we come back, we'll have more testimony from inside that Ohio case, and we'll give you an update on the other cases we're following here on the Law and Crime Trial Network. Stay with us. All right, so we were just listening to the chief toxologist uh, talk about the autopsy and some of the traces of drugs that were found in the victim um, after he died four uh, days after the fight at the bar. Ashley Wilcott, she joins me now via Skype. She's one of our long crime trial analysts and also a judge. What do you make of the fact that the toxologist talks about how they found uh, levels of fentanyl, which we all know is a very powerful hospital pain reliever that's only used by prescription and often abused, and also uh, traces of marijuana. Does that matter? Well, so the one thing that's significant, he said, and I'm looking at my notes, it was a low level of that painkiller that was found. And so I think his testimony then said basically, and so there would have been more use and now it was a residual low level. I think the piece of that that's imperative is to say that he, for the prosecution to use that to say he was under the influence and he was the aggressor and this was not, I mean, not the, that, that, that this was not necessary self-defense. Defense. I've said that backwards, Rachel. Let me know if that made sense or not. I think I'm following what you're saying, yes. But at, at the end of the day, the fact that the victim in this case, um, in, in other words, by the prosecution standards, the guy that died is the victim, uh, the, the defendant says he's the victim and that he killed this guy in self-defense. Regardless, the fact that there were trace amounts of this very powerful pain reliever and also some marijuana, you don't think uh, will really weigh that heavily on the jurors in terms of determining guilt here? Well, in terms of determining guilt in the prosecution's case, the answer is no. You find your victim as you find them, and what right. they are, what they're under, under the influence doesn't matter. But in terms of the defense, the self-defense argument, it's, it, it is important, and I do think that's going to weigh in the jury's mind, because you're saying it's self-defense, and he was under the influence in doing these things. So I think it could make a difference to the jury. All right. Thank you so much, Ashley. Stay with me for a few more minutes. We're going to take a quick break here on the Law & Crime Network. But when we come back, we'll take you inside the Tammy Moore case out of South Carolina. That's a fascinating win. Stay with us. All right, sorry about that, folks. For some reason, our clip was a bit glitchy there. It wasn't glitchy when we took it in live, so we'll be looking at that. But bottom line here, we had been discussing, Ashley and I, uh, some of these text messages that were discovered not only on Tammy Moore, the defendant's phone, but also on Sidney Moore's phone. Sidney Moore, of course, um, had his phone confiscated by his wife for, I would say, about a month, maybe two uh, leading up to the disappearance of Heather Elvis. And, of course, the reason why she confiscated that phone is because she found out that her husband there was having an affair with another woman who he had met at the Tilted Kilt. So, Ashley, as we, we weigh some of this text message testimony, it's also important to note that we had earlier today a motion to dismiss this whole case based on some of this text message testimony. Right. And so that's what we understand is the defense filed that motion for a mistrial, which is not atypical or unusual. I think there were two 
basically arguing that it was not relevant testimony to any of the particular charges of, of kidnapping or conspiracy to kidnap. All right, so let's continue. I think we got the, the sound bite fixed there. Let's continue to listen to more testimony from Officer Will Lynch talking about those text messages. All right, we're hearing about some of the text messages that Tammy was corresponding with her friend Christine Johnson. Do you make anything of this testimony, Ashley Wilcott? Could you hear it? Well, I can hear it off and on, but I just think it, again, to me, it muddies the waters. It's really trying to show the motive and all of the relationships. Because keep in mind, Rachel, we've already heard testimony that the Tammy, the defendant, also was at least having a sexting relationship with somebody. And so it's like, all right, you've got these two people who are just kind of all over the map with their infidelity and adulterous affairs and everything they're doing and it's in the text messages. It goes to the motive and why Tammy may have been so angry that she kidnapped the victim, Heather Elvis. By the way, Ashley, we heard during the opening statements from the defense that Tammy Moore is going to be taking the stand in her own defense. So I would assume that would probably come early or perhaps she'll be the last witness when the defense's case um, begins. But, you know, that's going to be interesting because she's going to be questioned about why she was texting with a young um, girl, a young guy. She's going to be asked all sorts of questions about these really uh, salacious text messages that she was engaged in back and forth. Use that. The prosecution is to really destroy her credibility. Let me say something. If I were the defense attorney at this point in time in the trial, we haven't heard all the evidence, but at this point in time, they don't have a body. I don't think that the evidence is overwhelmingly clear and beyond a reasonable doubt by 12 people. So I can't tell you I would put her on the stand at this point in time, but they did indicate that they would. This is going to be very interesting, and we're going to stream it all here live on the Law & Crime Network when Tammy Moore takes the stand in her own defense. Okay, let's listen to some more of those text messages between Tammy and some of her friends. Things got really weird. Okay, it's interesting to note that not only was Tammy using her cell phone to text people back and forth, she also had her husband's cell phone, Sydney Moore, and she was using that cell phone to text back and forth with this, before she disappeared, with this woman her husband was having an affair with, Heather, Heather Elvis. And um, if you read back some of the text messages, I'm going through my notes here, um, you know, and she's going through her notes in this video as well. Part of it is clear that Heather Elvis knew that it was Tammy doing the text messaging, and she actually seemed quite fearful. Why are you bothering me? Leave me alone. Leave me alone. And there's other times where it seemed like Heather thought she was talking to Sydney and not Tammy during this. I agree with you, Rachel. And here's what's really important to think about, too, is I think that ties in directly to the fact, and I'm looking at my notes again, that on the night of the disappearance, 12, 18, the, the 18th of December, 2013, at 3.38 in the morning, there were multiple calls from Heather to Sydney that were not answered. Now, I think there's good argument. If Tammy was using Sydney's phone to text or answer texts, then she might have been the one who had Sydney's phone and wasn't answering it. Very interesting stuff. Ashley Wilcott, stay with me. Actually, I have to say goodbye to you, but we'll be back here on the Law & Crime Network in just a few minutes. Stay with us.